Last week, we began a series of sermonic study um, to align ourselves with the season of Pentecost. These seven weeks after Easter, when we acknowledge the presence of Christ in and among his disciples before he ascends to heaven, and then the Holy Spirit comes. And I've invited you over this season of Pentecost to join with me in a teaching, a series of sermons about the Holy Spirit. Recognize that the Holy Spirit is one of the most controversial, divisive, and misunderstood doctrines within all of Christianity. That literally, when you speak about the Holy Spirit, you, you draw a line in the sand in Christianity between mainline Protestants on one hand and Pentecostals on the other. And I thought it would be expedient for us to do a little teaching and preaching about the Holy Spirit. The Lord confirmed that for me last Saturday when after the first part of the series, a sister came to me in the back of church with tears in her eyes. She said, I've always been afraid of the Holy Spirit because I've never understood the Holy Spirit. Many of us can relate to that because we were raised in traditions where we didn't talk about the Holy Spirit, we talked about the Holy Ghost. Um, and there was always a certain amount of fear attached to it. So today as we get back into our series on the Holy Spirit, I'm gonna invite you to the letters of John, particularly the first letter of John, now, they're the Gospels of the beginning. The best way to find the letters of John is go all the way to the book of Revelation at the back and go left a few pages, and you'll be in the letters of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. If you would join with me in a reading from 1st John, John's first letter, and we ask those who are physically able to stand with us for the reading of God's Word, beginning in chapter 5 and verse 1. 1st John, chapter 5 beginning in verse number one. The New King James, which reads different than the New International, reads as follows. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. Verse 7, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. Hang out in verse 7, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Today as we get back into part two of the Holy Spirit, I want to talk, teach, preach, from the subject three in one. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I think it's safe to say that when it comes to the Holy Spirit, many of us who are on the mainline Protestant side of the Baptist, the Presbyterian, the Methodist, the Episcopal, that we are a little Holy Spirit resistant that the same way Pentecostals run to the Holy Spirit, some of us subtly run away from. And Gil, that's partially because, one, we've not really been taught about the Holy Spirit. And two, our perception of the Holy Spirit is limited to what we see on the other side with our Pentecostal brothers and sisters. So many of us associate the Holy Spirit with the outward signs of Pentecostalism speaking in tongues, worship services that are filled with charismatic chaos, folk dancing in the aisles, people laying hands on folk at the altar and they laying out and someone coming and putting a white sheet over them, and worship services that seem to have no end. <laughs> and since you got brunch reservations, you're Baptist because you got somewhere to go at 12 o'clock. Um, and I want to remind you, as I did on last week, 
two real realities. Number one is that the Holy Spirit is not the exclusive property of Pentecostals. Pentecostals don't own the Holy Spirit. And as you will hear me say on next week, the Holy Spirit is the precious gift that God gives to every believer that the moment you receive Jesus Christ into your life as your Lord and Savior, God deposits the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Every born-again believer has the Holy Spirit. But you hear me say next week, the question is whether the Holy Spirit has you. We'll get there next week. Um, the second thing I want to remind you of is that you cannot really judge the presence of the Holy Spirit by what you witness in a worship service. No matter how many tongues you hear, no matter how many shouts of praise, no matter how many dancers in the aisle, no matter how many people are laid out, that in and of itself is not a full expression of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because if you remember from our teaching on Acts 3 last week, the real sign of the power of the Holy Spirit is not seen inside the church, but rather how we act outside. Get last week's lesson. This week, I thought in part two that I would initially address who has the Holy Spirit? When do you receive the Holy Spirit? To what degree do you get the Holy Spirit? Differentiating between the inception of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But while I was preparing that lesson, the Lord really pressed upon my heart the need to go back to some basics. And I pray that I am not offensive to those raised in the Pentecostal uh, background and have a PhD in the Holy Spirit, uh, but I want to deal with some Holy Spirit 101 today, and I simply want to ask the question, who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? Brother Barry, that question has been historically debated within the church for centuries. You'll recall from last week that the very first debate the church dealt with, that after Jesus ascends to heaven and the Holy Spirit comes and the church begins to move from the original apostles to the first generation, second generation, third generation Christians, that one of the very first issues they argued about and tried to understand was the divinity of Jesus Christ. They knew that Jesus was more than just a prophet, but they tried to wrestle with the divinity of Jesus, in particular, in relationship to God the Father. Was Jesus God? Was Jesus lesser God? Was Jesus another God? Was Jesus God Jr.? Was Jesus pseudo-God? They didn't understand, and there were many different thoughts about the divinity of Jesus. And so the way the church answered it, they formed what was called a church council a coming together of religious leaders from around the body of Christ. The first church council met in 325 A.D. in Nicaea, and it was called the Council of Nicaea. Everyone say Nicaea. Nicaea. They came together to argue about the divinity of Jesus, and their answer was affirmed in what they wrote called the Nicene Creed. Everyone say Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed is one of the first affirmations of faith within the body of Christ, and it dealt with the nature of Jesus in relationship to God. The answer for them came in a term presented by Athanasius called homoousios. Say it with me, homoousios. Homoousios, you know the prefix homo meaning the same. Usios is substance. Homo usios literally means same substance. And what the Council of Nicaea agreed upon was that Jesus is of the same substance as God. That Jesus is holy like God. Jesus is divine like God. Jesus is omnipotent like God. Jesus is eternal like God. As a matter of fact, Jesus is God. Jesus shares the same homo usios as God. Well, Marcia, as soon as they came to the understanding of the relationship of Jesus to God, you could probably guess that the next big issue of debate was going to be the nature of the Holy Spirit. 
They knew the Holy Spirit was real. They believed in the Holy Spirit. They, they felt the power of the Holy Spirit. But the question was, what is the relationship of the Holy Spirit to God and to Jesus? You have to understand that the debate about Jesus was easier than the debate about the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Because Jesus was real, flesh and blood. Jesus had followers. Jesus spoke. His followers all heard him say, I and the Father are one. So it was easy to give Jesus the same homoousios as God. But the Holy Spirit is different. The Holy Spirit is personal. The Holy Spirit doesn't shout to everyone in the same room. All of us could see Jesus and hear Jesus and agree on what Jesus said. But what the Holy Spirit speaks to me may be different than what the Holy Spirit speaks to you, may be different than what the Holy Spirit whispers to you. And now we're debating because we all believe the Holy Spirit has said something different to us. So what is the true nature of the Holy Spirit? This debate introduced us to some of the great theologians that helped shape Western Christianity. Theologians and church fathers like Athanasius, three bishops called the three Cappadocians, Basil, Gregory, and Gregory. It introduced to us a name like Tertullian, Irenaeus, and most importantly, that you'll hear me say in a minute, Augustine. The theologian Augustine. So they debate it. You heard people thinking different things about the Holy Spirit. So what did the church do? They did the same thing with the Holy Spirit they did with Jesus. They formed a church council. This council met in 381 AD in the city of Constantinople. The second church council was in 381 in Constantinople. And in that church council, they amended the Nicene Creed with what they agreed upon in Constantinople, and they created the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. <laughs> now, you, Nicene Creed was easy. Watch this one. Say it with me. Niceno-Constantinopolitan <laughs> Creed. See the names of the city. The Nicene Creed is amended with what they did in Constantinople, which is why you have the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. And in the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, they added their understanding of the Holy Spirit to what they understood about Jesus. And what they affirmed in the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed was that the Holy Spirit has the same homoousios as Jesus, which has the same homoousios as God, that the Holy Spirit has the same substance as Jesus and the same substance as God. It ended the issue, but it raised another one. Because part of their declaration was that this homoousios of God is made manifest in three hypostases. And the word hypostases is what we translate as persons. And so what came out of Constantinople is probably one of the most difficult doctrines of the church to deal with, and that is the doctrine of the Trinity. That now we believe God is made manifest in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Few things about the doctrine of the Trinity you ought to know. Number one is that the doctrine of the Trinity is a distinctive mark of Christianity. The same way the cross is our iconic symbol and our brand, at the core of our doctrine and our faith is the teaching about the Trinity that we believe that God is one and God comes to us in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Listen, you are not Orthodox Christian if you don't hold to God as three persons in one. It's what makes you Christian. We sing it in that great hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. Lord God Almighty, early in the morning, our song shall rise to thee. Y'all know that one? Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. The Trinity is a distinctive mark of Christianity. Not only is it distinctive, but it differentiates us. We are the only people on the face of the earth 
who claim that God is one in three people. Islam does not. Judaism does not. Hinduism does not. Buddhism does not. No other religion on the world suggests that there's one God who's three. That is a differentiating mark of Christianity. It is distinctive, it differentiates, and finally about the Trinity, it's difficult. If you've ever tried to explain Christianity and Trinity to someone, you know this is difficult. We can explain incarnation, we can explain atonement, we can explain justification, but one of the most difficult doctrines of the church to defend and explain is the doctrine of the Trinity. It almost seems self-contradictory to say that God is three people in one. How can three people be one? As a matter of fact, if you don't really understand the Trinity, you're going to have trouble when your faith is attacked by a devout Muslim or Jew. Because devout Muslims and Jews hold to the monotheism of God. There is only one God. And they look at Christianity and say that when you adopt the doctrine of the Trinity, you have shifted God from being monotheistic to tritheistic. That there are three gods. And an Orthodox Muslim and an Orthodox Jew will argue with you that Christianity is in error by teaching that God is three and one. So we've got to get a hold of this. For two reasons. Number one, you ought to understand why you believe what you believe. It is a shame to have a belief in your heart that does not resonate with some understanding in your head. That we are people who believe that just because our heart is engaged, excuse me, engaged, doesn't mean that our minds ought to be disengaged. Jesus says the Lord is looking for them that worship in spirit and in truth. Spirit in heart, truth in head, meaning that my head and my heart can be aligned with one another and I understand why I believe what I believe. And I believe that you cannot begin to understand the Holy Spirit if you don't get the Trinity right. That if the Trinity doesn't make sense in your head, you may be resistant to receiving the Holy Spirit in your heart. So today I want to just dig in for a few minutes about the Trinity. Is that all right? I pray someone's like, I Pastor, I need to know this. I need to know about the Trinity. Now, before we get into it, there's, there's a caveat I've got to make. There's a, um, there, there's a uh, word of warning I need to give, and it's simply this. God's ways are higher than ours. Amen. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says that as the heavens are above the earth, so are the ways of God above ours, which means that our understanding can't always understand God. God is bigger than your mind. God is bigger than your intelligence. God is bigger than your understanding. There comes a moment, my brothers and my sisters, where you just got to walk by faith. It may not make sense. You may not understand it. You may not be able to explain it. But there comes a moment when you just got to trust God at his word, obey God at his command, do what God has called you to do, even when you don't fully understand. Because God is bigger than us. Amen. And let me give you this one for free. Be careful of anybody that has God all figured out. Amen. Be suspect of folk that understand God from A to Z. Be careful of folk that think they always know what God is up to. God is bigger than any theology. God is bigger than any degree. God is bigger than any denomination. God is bigger than any church. God is bigger than any religion. God is bigger than our understanding. So we attempt to understand God, but acknowledge that God is bigger. So it seems to me that in order to understand the Trinity, which allows us to understand the Holy Spirit, we've got three things to do. Number one, we've got to establish that the same God that we acknowledge is in Jesus is the same God that is the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit God? First question needs to be answered. Let's start at the beginning of the Trinity. I pray that all of us in this place can acknowledge that there is a God. We believe that there is an eternal, sovereign, omnipotent creator of the heavens and the earth that exists. There is a God. Amen. Now, if you don't believe that there is a God, you are in the wrong, well, you're not in the wrong place. You're actually in the right place. But 
but, but there is a God. You are not God. You are not in control of your life. You don't fabricate and manipulate everything in your life. There is a higher power that is at work over your life and over this world, and we acknowledge that as being God. Somebody say there is a God. Now, when typically we say God, we associate that with God the Father, that there's no debate, there's no doubt that that God is holy, that God is sovereign, that God is omnipotent, that God is eternal, that God is omniscient. There is a God. And I pray that if you call yourself Christian, you will acknowledge that Jesus is also God that Jesus Christ is God made flesh. Jesus is the Word incarnate. Jesus is Emmanuel. He is our God with us. The Bible says in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And that Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, that Jesus is God made flesh. So there is a God. Jesus is God. The question now is, is the Holy Spirit that same God? Well, understand this. Peter believed the Holy Spirit and God were the same. We go home, read Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira have held back their offering from the church and it is a crime against the body of Christ. Peter calls Ananias out about it. And watch what Peter says. He says, Ananias, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? Ananias gives an answer about holding his money back. Peter then says, you've not lied to me, you've lied to God. You just missed it. Peter says, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? Ananias gives an answer. Peter says, you've not lied to me, you've lied to God. Third time's a charm. Peter says, you lied to the Holy Spirit. Ananias gives an answer. Peter says, you've lied to God because Peter understands that the Holy Spirit and God are the same. Paul believed the Holy Spirit was God. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is teaching the body of Christ, and he says to them in chapter 3, don't you know that your body is the temple of God? And then in chapter 6, he says, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You missed it. Don't you know your body is the temple of God? Don't you know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Third time's charm. Don't you know your body is the temple of God and the temple of the Holy Spirit? Because Paul understood God and the Holy Spirit are one. Hebrews 9 tells us the Holy Spirit is eternal. As a matter of fact, when God creates the heavens and the earth, the Bible says that the Spirit moved across the face of the earth because the Spirit was in existence before the earth was. The Holy Spirit is omniscient. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 2 that the Holy Spirit knows all things, even the mind of God. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. Paul says that whatever city he went to, he encountered the Holy Spirit because there's nowhere you can go and the Holy Spirit ain't there before you get there. And the Holy Spirit is omnipotent. How does Mary get pregnant? Ain't got nothing to do with JoJo. Gabriel says the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the Holy Spirit is so omnipotent that the Holy Spirit could impregnate a virgin without a man. As a matter of fact, let me prove to you how omnipotent the Holy Spirit is. Let me prove to you. How many of you all today, true testimony, can look at who you are today versus who you were before you got saved and know that God has changed you? Okay, okay. That ain't enough hands raised. How many folk know that you are not what you used to be? You don't do what you used to do. You don't go where you don't even have a taste for what you used to have a taste for. If you've been changed, wave a hand. Now watch this. If you know you've been changed, according to the Word of God, what changes you is not Jesus and not God the Father. What changes you is the presence of the Holy Spirit working on your heart and working on your mind and working on your mouth. So if you don't drink like you used to, that's the Holy Spirit. If you don't cuss like you want to, that's the Holy Spirit. If you don't drop it like you used to, that's the Holy Spirit. He has changed me. And 
Do, do, do you know how powerful the Holy Spirit has to be to change you? <laughs> you can't shout because you don't want your neighbor to know, but that's a whole lot of change. That's how powerful the Holy Spirit is. He can change you. The Holy Spirit is eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. The Holy Spirit is equated with God because the Holy Spirit is God. Well, if that's true, Pastor, then the second question we've got to answer quickly. Is God really three in one? To answer this question, we need to begin in Acts, I mean, excuse me, Exodus chapter 3. Let me tell you what happens in Exodus chapter 3. Moses has an assignment to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, God said, let his people go. So Moses says, listen, listen, God, listen, if you want me to go to Pharaoh and you want me to tell Pharaoh that God said, that God told me to tell you. <laughs> uh, I do more than read Bible. God told me to tell you that you need to let us go. Moses says, God, I need a name. Right? Because all the Egyptian gods have a name, and the gods of Egypt have one name that defines them. So I need a name to tell Pharaoh, otherwise he won't know your God. And this is what God tells Moses. Hey, tell him I am. Now, why does God say that? Because he wants Moses to know, listen, I'm not like Egyptian gods. I don't just have one name. I don't just have one way of being. I don't just have one identity. I will reveal myself through what I reveal myself through, that I will show you who I am by the things I do, and you'll find out that I'm more than just one thing. So watch what he says. I'm going to show you who I am. I I'm going to let you get your back against the wall, your feet to the fire with no one else to call on. I'm going to make a way and you'll know that I am Jehovah Jireh. I'm going to let you get sick with no medicine that can heal you. And when I deliver you, you'll know I am Jehovah Rapha. Oh, I'm going to let enemies come against you. And when I fight your battle, you'll know that I am the mighty God who makes ways for you. I will show you who I am. And I am not just one thing. I am. Now, now, the Jews understood that there was only one God. So in Deuteronomy 6, Moses gives them the commandment in verse 4 that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, he is one. There is only one God. But one of the most dominant names that the Jews used for God was Elohim. Everybody say Elohim. Elohim. Write that word down. Leave it up for a minute. Elohim, the suffix ending I am in Hebrew, is plural. One God, Elohim. There's one God, plural. There's plurality in unity. He's one, but he's plural. That, that's, that's partially why in creation, when God's ready to create Adam and Eve, he says, let us create them in, some Bible readers, our image. Unity in plurality. Now that's messing somebody up. So I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you figure out how to get this right. I'm going to help you figure out how to get unity and plurality right. Lee, welcome back. First of all, good to see you and Sister Lydia back. Snow bunnies, they go down to Florida in the winter. There's no winter in Virginia. <laughs> I'm from Chicago. This is not winter. <laughs> Lee, we're, we're, we're going to go to the store and... You're gonna buy me an outfit. We're gonna go. We're gonna go shopping together. Okay. We're gonna go buy an outfit. And we're going. We're going to Nordstrom's. Amen. Because <laughs> God is at Nordstrom. Amen. Yes, He is. <laughs> Trust me, He is. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. We'll go to Nordstrom, and we'll start shopping. Right. I'm gonna pull out a jacket, two sleeves, and you're gonna say to me, Pastor, that's a nice jacket. I'm gonna pull out a shirt. 
shirt has two sleeves, you're going to say to me, Pastor, that's a nice shirt. One jacket, nice jacket. One shirt, nice shirt. I'm going to hold up some pants. You're going to say, that's a nice pair of pants. <laughs> the jacket was one garment, and it was singular. The shirt is one garment, it's singular. The pants are one garment, but it's a pair. How can something singular be plural? Because pants are singular up top, but plural at the bottom. So high up, they're one. But when you get down to the ground, they're plural. Right. So somebody. Jackie, like, I'm taking that to work tomorrow. I got that, Pastor. I, I got that. That, that God is one. God becomes plural as you get down. And what the Bible affirms is that this one God chooses to reveal himself in three ways. This is not how we constructed God. This is how God reveals himself. I am one, but let me show you my threefold nature. And you see it in what the Bible gives us, which we call triadic passages. Triadic passages passages are passages in the Bible that show us the unique singular God as three in one place at the same time because that's how God reveals himself let me let me give you a couple creation God the Father is setting forth to create the heavens and the earth and the Bible says that in order to create God has to speak and what does God speak words what are those words? Let there be. What are those words? John 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And nothing was made that was not made by the Word. And that Word became flesh and dwelt among us as Jesus. So the Word that God speaks in creation is the pre-incarnate presence of Jesus Christ. God the Father speaks the word that will become Jesus. And when God the Father speaks the word that becomes Jesus, the Spirit of God moves across the face of the earth because we see the Father who speaks the pre-incarnate word, which initiates the moving of the Spirit. So in creation, we see all three at once. Okay, that didn't get you? Come on down to the Jordan River. John is baptizing folk. Jesus shows up. Jesus says, John, you got to baptize me. When John baptizes Jesus, the heavens open and God begins to speak. And God says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And when the father speaks over the son, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove and rests on the shoulder of Jesus so that you can see the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit in one place. Go on, teach, Pastor. I'm trying. Um, Jesus leaves us in Matthew 28 and he says before I leave you I want you to give you an assignment I want you to go and baptize folk in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit make sure when you quote that you quote it correctly Jesus does not say baptize in the name of the Father the name of the Son and the name of the Holy Spirit because that would be three different uses of the term name no he says in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit and what will blow your mind is in Greek the word name in that verse is singular baptize them in one name what's that one name Father Son Holy Spirit because that's his name Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that's all one. It's one name. It's the same God who chooses to reveal himself as three in one. But this is not how we constructed God. This is how God reveals himself, three in one. So let's get to the last question. First question, is the Holy Spirit God? Peter, Paul, Bible says yes. Second question, can God be three in one? Well, that's how God chooses to reveal God's self. The last question, and it's the one that we really have to answer because it messes a lot of people up, how can three people be one? Three people cannot be the same. 
three of y'all on the pew ain't the same. No matter how close you are to somebody, you're different. Both, I have two sons, and, and they, Gil, my sons are just like me, just like me. They have my DNA. Deuce has freckles in the same place on his face as I do. And Cooper. <laughs> that boy is my personality all day long. I beat him so much because he, 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 <laughs> I, I don't, I do not, I'm, I'm not an advocate of child abuse. <laughs> For the record, I have never had to spank my children. I believe that, that if I have to resort to corporal punishment, I've lost my authority as a, pa a parent. I can get my children right by just looking at them right. Cooper's me all day long. Have, any, anybody here have more than one, ki one kid? Isn't it amazing how different they can be? Same house, same food, same lessons. <laughs> Just different. My oldest son, Deuce, he can't lie if he tried. <laughs> he doesn't think fast enough. He, 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 if he get caught, you know, let me just tell the truth. You know what I mean? <laughs> he ain't smart enough. But that, that young one, ooh. Let me say, if Cooper tells you it's Tuesday, you better check your calendar. It might be Monday. <laughs> that boy is quick on his feet. He always has an answer for everything. He is never going to be wrong. He's going to win a fight. No, he is such his dad. It is such a shame. <laughs> Even though he's like me, we're different. I'll never be Cooper. He'll never be Howard John. How can two people be the same? The problem is our use of the word three persons in one. Persons is a word in our language that comes close to describing God, but is limited. Because God can't be described as a person. Persons are limited. Now, clearly, clearly, the Holy Spirit has personality. When you read through scripture, You'll find many instances where we see the Holy Spirit has intelligence. The Holy Spirit has will. The Holy Spirit has emotion. Paul says it's possible to grieve the Holy Spirit. You can't grieve an impersonal object. The Holy Spirit has personality, which is why, hear me, to be biblically correct, you should never refer to the Holy Spirit as it. The Holy Spirit is not a thing. The Holy Spirit is person. So when Jesus teaches about the Holy Spirit in John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus always uses the personal pronoun he and him. Do not call the Holy Spirit it. The Holy Spirit is a person. Now, what will blow your mind is when you research in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is always linked to the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God is Sophia. And Sophia is feminine. Which means... You are biblically correct to call the Holy Spirit her. I thought this was a progressive church. I thought we were going to have some sisters. Amen, Pastor. Amen. So when I talk about the Holy Spirit, I can say she comforts me. She leads me. She speaks to me. She empowers me. As a matter of fact, I'm just giving the pastoral decree that from now on, when I talk about the Holy Spirit, you're going to hear me refer to her as she so that you understand God is bigger than gender. The Holy Spirit is not a man. The Holy Spirit is not a woman. But I can call her she. So, the Holy Spirit is not a person, but she has personality. And this is where Augustine becomes critical. Because Augustine, one of the greatest theological minds to shape Western Christianity, understood that person is a metaphor that fails. At a certain point, you can't talk about God as a person because it's hard to see three people as the same. Augustine says the better way to see God is not based on the metaphor of person, but to see God based upon his functions and his relationship with the world. That what we see are God performing in three different functions. 
So here's the argument. When you see and refer to God the Father, you're not talking about a literal father. You're using that as a metaphor for God who is a creator. That God the Father, that, that's the power of God to take nothing and make something. That, that, that's God working evil together for your good. That's God hearing your prayers and opening doors you didn't even know existed. That, that's God moving mountains out of your way. That's God dealing with your enemies and your obstacles. That's God cranking your life and blessing you with something you don't deserve. That God is creating blessings in your life. He is a creating God. But not only does God create, but God also redeems. Because God doesn't just want to bless you, God wants to be in relationship with you. And so what you call God the Son is the creating God who's now redeeming you out of the hand of the enemy into right relationship with him. And that same God who creates and redeems is also the God who sustains. Because God knows you can't be holy without his help. You can't live right without his presence. So God not only blesses you and redeems you, God steps inside of you through the presence of the Holy Spirit to help you live a life that is acceptable unto him. Somebody say creator. creator. Somebody say redeemer. redeemer. Somebody say sustainer. Redeemer. That's who God is, my creator, my redeemer my sustainer. Let me let you out of here. The best way to understand it is to think about function. And allow me, if you will, not in an egotistical or self-aggrandizing way, but with humility to use myself as an example. Okay? I am, I am Howard hyphen John Wesley. Not John Wesley Howard, not John Howard Wesley, not Wesley John Howard. I'm Howard hyphen John Wesley. That's my name. It's been that way since 1972. I am who I am. I'm Howard John Wesley, and there's only one of me. <laughs> and my mother would say, praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm Howard John Wesley. That's my name. That's who I am. But I have three different functions. I'm a parent. I'm a pastor. And I'm a PhD student. I, it's, just, it's just me. But I have three different functions in the world. I'm a parent. I'm a pastor. And I'm a PhD student. There's one. But I have three different functions. I parent. I pastor. I'm a PhD student. And the amazing thing is that depending on what role I'm in, I'm called by a different name. My children call me dad. My members call me pastor. My classmates call me Howard John. People call me by the name that's based upon the relationship of the role I play with them. My sons don't call me Howard John. <laughs> I, don't, I don't advocate <laughs> child abuse. This is dramatic presentation, OK? My classmates don't call me daddy. <laughs> I, I ain't even going to say it because I ain't getting no email. I'm not going to get slapped on the hand. All right. Uh, I'm one person, three roles, called by three different names. And in each role, I have a different responsibility. As a parent, I've got to train up these boys. As a pastor, I've got to oversee the flock. As a student, I've got to read, write, and pass exams. I have three different functions, but I'm all one person. And the amazing thing is, I never stop being all three. When I'm a parent, I'm still a pastor. And when I'm a pastor, I'm still a parent and a student. When I'm a student, I'm still a pastor and a parent. That whenever I'm functioning in one, 
I'm always doing the others automatically. I never just limit myself to one. When, when, I, when I'm parenting, I'm still pastoring because when I've got my boys, I'm still taking care of the business of the church. When I'm a student and I'm away in class, I'm still overseeing the business and governance of the church because no matter what role I'm in, I'm still doing all the others. Right now, I'm standing before you as a pastor. Right now, I'm preaching the word of God. Right now, you're calling me pastor. But right now, I'm also still a parent because right now at 12 o'clock, my son is about to get on an AAU court to play a game and I've got to call him before that game. I've got to encourage him and I've got to remind him to play his best and when he steps on that court, those LeBron James Nike shoes he's wearing, his daddy bought him and so I'm still parenting him even while I'm pastoring you. And while I'm sitting here preaching and pastoring and still parenting my children, guess what? I'm still being a student. I'm still studying. Where you think all this history came from? Where you think all this lecturing comes from? You know my sermons have changed since I got back in school. <laughs> that I bring it all together. That I'm three in one and I never stop being what I do in all three. Let me tell you about God. God is always creating. He's always making a way. He's always opening a door. He's always blessing me. He's always moving me. God is always redeeming. He's always forgiving me. He's always drawing me close. He's always taking care of me. God is always sustaining. He fills me every day. He strengthens me every day. He walks with me every day. God is three in one. He's three 